Hi everyone, and welcome to week three of this course. The Sixth Dynasty is the last dynasty of the Old Kingdom. Sometimes the Seventh and Eighth Dynasties are included in the Old Kingdom, but we're going to talk about those next week with the First Intermediate Period. By this time, the religious institutions of ancient Egypt had become a dominant force. The pharaoh's power began declining, while the priesthood and the nobility's power began to rise. The growth of bureaucracy intensified during Unus's rule, which continued into the Sixth Dynasty. Teddy was the first king of the Sixth Dynasty. While it is not exactly clear how he rose to power, his wife, Iput, was the daughter of Unus, so it seems to be that he rose to power as the son-in-law of the previous pharaoh. Through his three known wives, Teddy had at least three sons and possibly ten daughters. Many of these daughters were married to viziers and other officials, which may have been a way to cooperate with the noble class. At this time, high officials were beginning to build their own funerary monuments, which rivaled the pharaohs in decoration and statuary. One of these examples is of his vizier, Mararuka, who built a mastaba in Saqqara with 33 richly carved and decorated rooms. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to talk about him today, but I will post a link to a thorough discussion of his mastaba. Teddy had a pyramid built at Saqqara. The complex had all the features of a pyramid temple, although the valley temple seems to be lost, as it may be under a later temple for Anubis. The pyramid had a descending corridor and a horizontal passage that was guarded by three granite portcullises. The burial chamber also had an unfinished gray wacky sarcophagus. There were also a few grave goods that were left by tomb robbers. This included a series of club heads, one canopic jar with the viscera of the king, and a plaster mold of a death mask, which could have been of Teddy. The pyramid also has surviving pyramid texts in the burial chamber. There was a very large necropolis that surrounded this pyramid. Two of his wives and his mother had pyramid complexes, and several of his officials had large mastabas. Interestingly, the Egyptian priest Manetho that we talked about a couple weeks ago recorded that Teddy was murdered by his palace bodyguards in a harem plot, but he may have actually been assassinated by the usurper and next pharaoh Usurkare. There is very little known of Usurkare, so it is not clear if he ruled as a legitimate ruler or if he did usurp the throne. Nonetheless, he may have only ruled from one to five years and left no pyramid or funerary complex. After Usurkare, the next pharaoh was Pepi I Marin Re, who was the son of Teddy. Pepi I had quite a few difficulties during his rule. Besides the possible murder of his father, he faced a harem conspiracy hatched by one of his queens who wanted her son on the throne. He may have also faced another conspiracy with one of his viziers. Six of the wives of Pepi I have been identified, and he most likely fathered at least four sons, two of which became pharaoh, and three daughters, all of which were wives of Pepi II. These three statues are some of the famous of Pepi I. On the left are two copper statues. These were found under the floor of the Ka Chapel of Pepi I in Hierakompolis. They were most likely made by hammering plates of copper over a wooden base. The large statue is identified as Pepi I, but the small statue could be identified as a young Pepi I or of his son and initial heir, Meren and Ray. The smaller statue was actually found within the pieces of the larger statue, and they're both currently located at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The statue on the right is a travertine statue that depicts the king in a hebsed robe. This portrait is extremely similar to that of Kasakemwi that we saw from the Third Dynasty. It also has a falcon bird on the back, which is meant to represent the god Horus. This statue is located at the Brooklyn Museum. Pepi I had a pyramid complex built for him in South Saqqara. This complex was called Menefer Pepi, which means the perfection of Pepi is established. Interestingly, the word Menefer became the name of the nearby capital of Egypt, which in Greek was called Memphis. The pyramid was built in six steps that were then filled in and then encased in limestone blocks. There were three chambers in the substructure, an antechamber, a surdab chamber, and the burial chamber. A pink granite canopic chest which was sunk into the floor was found undisturbed, presumably with the viscera of the king. The chambers and corridors are covered in hieroglyphs, which detail the most extensive corpus of pyramid texts. This complex included a mortuary temple, a cult pyramid, a causeway, and a valley temple. Either the mortuary temple or the valley temple may have been lined with statues of kneeling, bound captives. 
There are several tombs for the royal family and officials surrounding the pyramid. Pepi I specifically built six satellite pyramids for his six known consorts. Pepi I was succeeded by his lesser-known son, Marin Ray, who ruled for about 10 years and built a pyramid in Saqqara. He was then succeeded by Pepi II Neferkare, who was either his son or his brother. Pepi II Neferkare's rule marked a sharp decline in the Old Kingdom. The power of the pharaohs was still declining, while the local governors, who were called nomarchs, were gaining power and raiding others' territories. This alabaster statue depicts Pepi II and his mother. His mother was Ankh Sn Pepi II, who was first married to Pepi I and then to Marin Ray. The emphasis is obviously on his mother, as she is much larger than the king. She is wearing a vulture headdress, which was a typical crown for Egyptian queens and Egyptian queen mothers to wear. The Egyptian word for mother is moot, and is written with a vulture hieroglyph. This may be because the Egyptians observed how the vulture tends to circle their prey, the way a mother may circle and protect their child. There is a chance that Pepi II rose to the throne at a very, very young age, and his mother may have been his regent. This statue is currently located at the Brooklyn Museum. This other statue depicts him as a child. He is depicted naked with a finger over his mouth. These, again, are the two features that are used to depict children in Egyptian art. He is although wearing a king's headdress with a uraeus, which is a snake that can be seen on the forehead. This may represent how young Pepi II was when he rose to power, or this may be a sign of a renewal or rebirth of the king. If Pepi II became pharaoh at the age of six, he may have had one of the longest roles in Egyptian history, because he was reported to live to a hundred. Pepi II's pyramid was also built in Saqqara, and it was the final full pyramid complex built in ancient Egypt. There was a band of brickwork along the bottom of the pyramid, which may have been done to resemble the hieroglyph for pyramid or to fortify the structure because of an earthquake. The burial chamber had a gabled ceiling covered in painted stars. Three queen's pyramids were built with their own chapel, temple, and satellite pyramid, which all contain different versions of the pyramid text. The mortuary temple also had scenes showing Pepi II spearing a hippopotamus, his Hebsed festival, and him executing a Libyan chieftain. The last pharaoh of the Sixth Dynasty is quite a mystery. The ancient Greek writers Herodotus and Manetho all mention a legend about a female pharaoh named Nitocris, who succeeded her brother after he was murdered and wanted to avenge his death. Egyptologists believe that she may have been the daughter of Pepi II and Queen Neith, and thus the first female pharaoh in Egyptian history. It now seems the name Nitocris was derived from a name of a male pharaoh named Netjer Kare Sipta I. It seems that this is not an example of the first female pharaoh of ancient Egypt, but rather another male pharaoh who is not well known. The last topic I wanted to talk about today is a new style that emerged in this period. This is called the Second Style, and it emerged at the end of the Fifth Dynasty and throughout the Sixth Dynasty. This style was not completely widespread, but there are multiple examples within the nobility. The main features of the style are listed here. Bodies tended to be depicted as more long and narrow and willowy. They had large eyes and slightly upturned lips, and they are usually less stiff than typical Egyptian statuary. Now let's go over some of the best examples of the second style. These statues are located at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and all depict a man named Tajedi. Tajedi was a granary official, most likely during the rule of Teddy, as he was buried near his pyramid. Two of these statues show Tajedi as a young man, wearing a short wig, while the other shows him as an older man. The second style indicates that there was a change in the ideal male physique. No longer were men expected to look strong and built, like in the third and fourth dynasties. These men are portrayed much more graceful and thin. What is interesting about Tajedi is that a stone statue was also found in his tomb, and this depicts him in the typical Egyptian fashion of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th dynasties. These four statues depict an official named Mejedi. The three on the left are from the Brooklyn Museum, and the one on the far right is from the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. These statues depict the official at different times of his life. As you can see, the artists of the second style prefer a more thin and unproportioned man. This style was not just used on officials. This statue of Pepi I at the Brooklyn Museum shows many of the features of the second style. Unlike the other statues, it's made out of a green slate and has inlaid eyes and a copper frame. 
It depicts the king kneeling and offering two new pots, which are ritual vessels that would have held milk or wine. He has quite large and expressive eyes and a slight smile on his face. The second style's importance during this period is evident because it eventually made its way into the royal artisans and an actual statue of a king was created in this style. Now that we have completed the Old Kingdom, we're going to move to the First Intermediate Period next week. Because the Intermediate Periods are described as periods where there was no centralized Egyptian government, I will be talking less of the specific dynasties and pharaohs and just focusing on the various art styles of the period. Thanks and stay safe.